We're speaking with Frank Holmes, CEO of U.S. Global Investors, about the future of cryptocurrencies as a form of payment, as well as measuring inflation accurately. Two very different topics, two very exciting topics. Frank, we're going to be going over both of them. Welcome back. Great to be back, David. Always good to have you, Frank. Big news of the week, Visa and PayPal are both now joining companies in allowing consumers to pay for their goods using cryptocurrency. So PayPal announced that U.S. customers can use both, well, a, ho a host of instruments, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Ethereum, and Bitcoin Cash. But these have to be first converted into fiat currencies first before the transaction can be processed. Visa is taking it one step further. Their Bitcoin using Visa doesn't even have to be converted into U.S. dollars first. It's automatically accepted as a form of payment. So this brings me to my question, Frank. People, are one, people have been wondering when and uh, how cryptocurrencies can finally be accepted as a form of payment. Is this it? Is this the day that that's finally happening? It is happening. And, and PayPal was the first. And you could see what was taking place with PayPal uh, being able to Bitcoin appreciate. Uh, young people would turn around. And, and what's interesting is you could buy a fraction so at $50,000, you don't have to write a check for $50,000 for one coin. You can buy $500 or $1,000 of PayPal. And, and as Bitcoin rallies, you could turn around and convert it to buy. Remember, gold money did this a while ago with gold, uh, where you could convert your money into gold. As gold was going up, you could turn around and use your credit card. Uh, and, and that was always a fascinating tool. But the, the broad adoption hasn't really taken place as it, as it is taking place with PayPal. And Visa does take it to a higher level because there's better software, David. And a lot of that software comes out of Vancouver in Canada, uh, where they've been able to, to basically test and they can find, because of it's a blockchain, if that coin was in the dark cloud, if it was in the bad area, was it used for uh, hackers, et cetera. They, they know where it's been. Uh, they don't know who has had it, but they know mm -hmm. where it's been. And if it's been to a shady area, it's not going to go in. So software is allowed visa it's allowed law enforcement to go after people so i think this adoption process is accelerating and that's why i did a short clip a week ago for like a minute explaining metcalf's law metcalf's mm -hmm. law says that as adoption accelerates you get these exponential moves in the underlying crypto yeah tell us about metcalf's law what do you mean by that how does this apply here well, basically, you're seeing that it's highly correlated to the number of wallets. So as more and more people open accounts to buy stocks, the stock market goes up. As more and more people can turn around and buy a fraction of a share. The old days, you used to split a stock to turn around and get more people buying. Today, software allows you to give you a fraction of a stock. So the success of Robin Hoods of the world, and Schwab does it too in America now, you can buy a fraction of Berkshire Hathaway. You can buy a fraction of Bitcoin. You can buy a fraction of gold. A GLD basically also allowed you, you could buy a fraction of it. So this is really fascinating and it allows it, what the math says is that more and more people buy and the supply is restricted or cannot facilitate that fastest growth as the wallets are growing or the new accounts, you get these exponential moves. And that's what we're witnessing. It was explained, it explains how cellular phones took off. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really working well in understanding Bitcoin and Ethereum. Do you think now is a good time to be launching this service? Are there enough users of cryptocurrencies out there to warrant a service like this, Frank? Well, let's think about the big picture, a very big macro. In the baby boomers, my age, mm -hmm. millennials, your age, we're going to go through a transfer of wealth over the next 30 years of something like $10 trillion. So that $10 trillion and you as a group, as a, as a demographic group, uh, are used to digital money from, from playing games, from video games. Uh, it, it's, a non, it, it's just part of your life. And so the idea and this concept of what I call the second derivative of trading an intangible and I've seen that in the ETF business, David. It's what, eight years ago when Greece shut down for six weeks, the Greek ETF stopped all redemptions and new creates of money going into it 
$400 million traded every day for six weeks when the stock exchange and the economy was shut down in Greece. And so an intangible traded off an ETF of modeling off the underlying securities based on all this math and it traded. You could go in and out of, of trading around a $400 million bundle of shares. Uh, that's remarkable. So today that's what we're witnessing, this idea of intangibles trading. Uh, the concept of Bitcoin is an intangible of a very elegant, like a piece of Picasso art, uh, a Monet that's 64 characters. It's so unique that it, and it's being adopted more readily by millennials. Visa and PayPal are basically catering to you and the transfer of wealth over the next 30 years. Wow, okay. How long would this adoption take, you think? I think we're in early, you know, early innings of it. Uh, we had the big run-up in, in 2017, the winter of 2018, the bottom trough of, of uh, 19, 2020, uh, was recently the first next big leg. So the next four to eight years, uh, and also the Bank of International Settlements. I mean, mm -hmm. this guy is the CEO there was trash talking crypto and everything's bad about it all through the winter. And all of a sudden now he's got religion and he's talking about digital money with central banks and digital money and crypto. So it's, it's in a big C wave. I've heard this phrase, Bitcoin is a good store of value, but a terrible form of payment. Is that, do you agree with that given this week's news? No, I think that if you believe in inflation and you think inflation is understated like I do, and I believe in John Wood's research on shadow statistics, that if you use the algorithm to, to define CPI in 1980, you use it today, inflation is 9%. Uh, Wall Street Journal ran a, ran a story this week showing housing across the U.S. Some places up 17, 18 uh, percent. We're seeing a bubble in real assets. So we're seeing money flow into them. I think that gold is way understated because there's lots of um, quant and hedge funds that is pair trading off the 10 year government bond versus gold. And unless the real rate of return is very negative. So right now it's not. So therefore, gold is not attractive. I yeah. say they're wrong. I say that inflation is running at 9% because if we brought in food and energy into the CPI number like we did in 1980, inflation is 9, 10%. If you did that, the 10-year government is, yield is really, really cheap at less than 1.8%. So therefore, gold would be trading substantially higher, higher. So I think that gold is one of the great asset classes uh, for the past 20 years. It's gone through many of these legs of underperforming but it's outperformed the S&P by 250%. So goals down this last quarter, back it up, make sure it's part of your diversified portfolio. And if you're younger or you can have a higher weighting in the crypto space, I believe in having 2% in crypto or crypto mining like high blockchain, which I'm the chairman of, you know, I'm very biased with that, but it's highly volatile, much more volatile than gold is. But we look at Elon Musk's uh, car, it's more volatile than Bitcoin. Tesla is more volatile than gold, the stock market, and cryptocurrencies. All right, uh, Frank, we're going to talk about uh, CPI and measuring inflation accurately in just a minute, but I want to go back to uh, Bitcoin first as a form of payment. Now, people were criticizing Bitcoin as a form of payment. They're saying that Bitcoin is a better store of value than it is a better form of payment. Uh, do you, I mean, would you agree or disagree with this viewpoint given... <laughs> No, David, David, no, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if something is going up so rapidly yeah. and you buy it for $10,000 and you bought one coin yeah. and all of a sudden $60,000 in a year and you mm -hmm. start making payments with it, it's a great way of you being able to you could buy a new car with it in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, talking about payment of buying real assets, no. Is, it, is there a friction cost with it? Yes, there is. Is there a conversion more expensive, yes, there is. But the uh, the fact is that you believe that there's a, um, inflation is understated, and you're seeing uh, this sort of distortion of capital flows. Then it's actually a very attractive way to be able to buy goods. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Um, what other coins do you think could be used as a good form of payment besides Bitcoin and the big ones like Ethereum, Bitcoin? Do you see any other coins um, appearing in the marketplace? 
Sure, but I really think Ethereum is a smart contract, mm -hmm. and, and Ethereum is is much more of a transaction for securities payments, for insurance, uh, the, the, how you can embed it within that smart contract and economic value. And that's why all the stable coins are booming. Last year, Bitcoin got all the attention, it was up 300%, gold was up 25%, but Ethereum was up 475. What happened on March the 8th of this year was the launching of, of Ethereum futures contract on the CME. Now Ethereum is going to get much more publicity and fanfare. And, and with these NFTs, uh, the use of, of DeFi, decentralized finance mechanisms, et cetera, they all use Ethereum mm -hmm. as their architecture. So I remain much more bullish on Ethereum as for transactions uh, and, and the evolution that next level. Remember, when, when the internet first came out, there was Ask Jeeves, and then there was Yahoo, and then came Google, and Ask Jeeves has basically disappeared, and Yahoo Finance is the only real strength of Yahoo, and Google takes over. So okay. maybe Ethereum takes over. What does this uh, new form of transaction or this new method of payment mean for prices of cryptocurrencies, Frank? Well, the prices is a mechanism of supply and demand. And demand is, is really triggered by more and more people adopting the, and believing in them as a portion of a, a way to make payments or make investments or save money with. Uh, and that adoption is going to drive the prices higher. The supply is basically Bitcoin last year in May have the daily supply. So every 10 minutes, you used to get uh, 12 and a half uh, coins, and now you're getting 6.25 coins, uh, new coins. So that supply is restricted. If that happened to gold, gold would be at 10,000 tomorrow. So we have to take a look at supply demand dynamics for Bitcoin and Ethereum are much more positive and faster than, than how they're evolving than for gold supply. Uh, but gold is gonna always be with central banks, Gold is yeah. something you can wear. So gold is so special as an asset class. And never forget that love trade is still 60% of gold. You can't wear your Bitcoin unless it looks like gold. Uh, and, and I think that that's a really key element of 5,000 years of history of gold. So I believe that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and gold are inclusive as alternative asset classes, and it's wise to be long. Right. Now, um Let's talk about uh, gold in just a minute, uh, in, for just a bit now, Frank. You and I have spoken about your four thousand dollar gold price target because you think that the monetary uh, stimulus will contribute to price growth as it has during the last financial crisis. I wonder now, Frank, have you made similar comparisons to Bitcoin? Have increases in the money supply uh, correlated with increases in the Bitcoin price in the past? Has this, is this something you've looked at? We're, we're dealing with other forces. We're dealing with a demographic, a young demographic. Uh, we're dealing with the supply being halved. And we're dealing with the adoption of a new technology. And, and remember when steel prices first, uh, the steel was expensive and it never really took off. It was too expensive. But when Carnegie became the richest man in the world because he found a way to do it on grand scale and he was able to drop steel prices by 80% and boom, we had industrialized cities and skyscrapers and Otis elevators, all this came because you were able to get the prices of that commodity down. There's an evolution of all of a sudden adopting to steal. Uh, I think the idea of, of digital money and the adoption is just going to grow. Okay, very good. Let's talk about inflation now. You had sent me some uh, interesting notes over the weekend about uh, how you think inflation should be measured. Now, you don't think that the CPI currently is Measuring inflation accurately? If so, if not, then what is a better form of measuring inflation, Frank? Well, it's, it's what does it cost for energy and what is the cost for food? And that's something that your disposable income, especially in America, you're predominantly in Texas, you drive everywhere and gas is an important part of your costs. Food is another important part of living and food and energy costs are up substantially in the past year. Uh, now we want to talk about uh, steel prices are up 70%. Lumber prices are up 100%. Buy a car now, because I tell you, take a look at used cars. They're up 23% in pricing. And, and if you embed in, in two years from now with new steel coming into new cars, 
car prices are so inexpensive right now you want to back up and make sure if you have to make a purchase find a way to buy cheap, get cheap money to buy them now uh housing uh with the COVID, everyone was stuck in their homes there's a huge boom in fixing up your homes look at home depot and low stocks look at lumber stocks so i think that there's some really important new dynamics taking place and inflation is not really in, capturing the cost of buying a new house. It's not capturing buying a new car. It's not capturing buying food. And if you embedded those in, you would have inflation at nine and 10%. So that means cheap money is out there right now. Get it. Wow. Okay. So, so we really should be adopting an older form of measuring inflation is what we should be doing to be more accurate. Absolutely. If, if, if the 10 year government yield is 1.75% and inflation really in, in how we live is running at 9%, that's a huge negative rate of return. If you can borrow inexpensively uh, to go and buy real assets, go do it. I mean, it's just wise. Uh, if you're going to renovate your house, do it now because prices are just going to be much higher. All right. Frank, fast that. Wow. I'll do that one more time on that. Frank, fantastic thoughts as always. Thank you very much for coming on. Great talk. Thank you, David. And happy holidays to you. Yes, happy holidays to you too. Enjoy your long weekend. And thank you for thank watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin.